Most people understand education in three words, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Everything else is a support mechanism for that. At least that's what most people think. And I wanna deal with one of those ideas and that is the deal of reading. Now, as a scientist and a science teacher, I find it very, very interesting that people don't think scientists need to know how to read. Well, think about this. If you're an athlete, do you not need to know how to run or to use your hands or your cardiovascular system? Do they not need to be trained? Of course they do. There's something called general conditioning. And so the basics of reading are taught in our lower school beautifully. And as they come into the upper school, they find that the reading gets a little more specific. So it'd be like uh, an athlete being trained and then one season will play basketball. The next season they'll run track and field. The next season they will be a football player. And so the specifics of how to do that are very interesting. So if we take a look at reading the same way, we have our general idea of reading, but it wouldn't apply specifically in each area. For example, if you had a book from the 1660s, uh, Thomas Brooks, a Puritan writer called The Secret Key to Heaven, uh, you wouldn't read this the same way that you would read a biography on Stonewall Jackson because they're completely different, yet the basics of reading are identical. You would be a little bit different if you were using Mark Levin's book, right? Rediscovering Americanism because that has a lot to do with the politics of modern day. And you would read a little bit different if you were reading a popular novel, one of my favorite authors, Clive Cussler, you would read a little bit differently. Basics being the same, but the specifics being a little different. Now, when you come to a science text, it's even more different. Now, again, the basic ideas are the same but the specifics are a little bit different. What I'd like to do in this video is deal with the specifics of how to read a science text. And I hope that it is helpful for you. So really, how do you read a science textbook? Well, the first thing you want to look for is the chapter or section outline that is at the beginning of every section. You take a look here, it gives you the objective. So it gives you kind of a target for what you're going to be learning within that particular section. If you don't read this, then you're reading and gathering information and not really knowing why you're gathering it. The vocabulary that you should be looking for are listed usually in that lesson objective as well. The other thing you can do is check the chapter or section summary or glossary. Now here, ck12.org, it's the chemistry section of that, this lesson summary tells you what you did learn, and these match the original lesson plan itself. You can also, also have follow-up readings and supplemental links to help you along with this process. Now, in reading the text itself, one of the first thing you want to do is look for bold face type. Now you can see the bold face type here. One of them says neutral salt, the other says basic salt, and this last one says acidic salt. And so I'll highlight those with this yellow highlighter. And that's one of the techniques that you can use is you can highlight your um, bold face print. These are the vocabulary words that you find from your chapter, lesson, and section outline. You'll see them down here. I'll highlight them for you. The acidic salt, basic salt, neutral salt, those were the three that were boldface on this particular text. Now, another thing you can do is you can find things with bullet points. Now, bullet points are really helpful. They tell you a list of things, but here's the critical aspect of bullet points. The, they emphasize these things but without placing them in an order that implies a value or ranking. So it's not like phenolphthalein is more important than phenol red and that bromocressal green is more important than methyl red. It's just the fact that these four things have been set apart in this particular list. So that's really important to understand about bullet points. The next thing is photos or captions. You can see in this picture of a titration experiment, it actually gives you a caption. 
And so instead of just having a picture going, oh, isn't that neat? Let me go on and keep reading because I need to get this done. You actually can take a look, take 20 or 30 seconds to look, the burette, the stir bar, and the pH electrode. And this gives you an understanding of what this setup can do. The next thing is the section headings. You can actually say, if I want to know about titration, right there, the section heading gives it to me, the titration process. And it tells you what titration is. Again, a bold face um, word that you can use in your vocabulary. One of the other things you'll find are formulas, the mathematics of titration. These formulas become very, very important. And one of the techniques that I like to do is I like to put a little red star next to the formula. So if I'm looking for a formula, I flip through my text really quickly and I say, there's the red, red one. And I know that that's a formula associated with titration. Mass of the acid times the volume of the acid equals mass of the base times the volume of the base. Really important to know what the variables mean and they're listed right here underneath the star. Another idea is these examples. Most people look at an example and they immediately look at how, how to solve it. I would challenge you that the examples are there in the place that they are because you have enough information on how to solve this without looking at the solution. So could you put a piece of paper over the solution and solve this example right here and see how well you did? Well, if you did that, then you can open up the solution and you can see if you got the right answer of 12.5 milliliters. Now, another thing to know about these examples, they give you the steps that you need to solve the puzzle so that you don't have to come up with your own steps. Now, if you did it correctly, you probably followed these ideas. If you did not, then you can look at the steps and try to get an idea of what's the process that we're going through because we're searching for process because the correct process always gives the correct answer. Now, let's take a look at other things that are in some texts. The CK12 text has links to video or other works. So here, they actually have a video of a titration with an indicator that you can copy that, post it, pop it into your, um, into your browser, and watch that on YouTube. Now, some of the other things that we talked about before, markings in the text. If you are allowed to mark in your text, you should come up with a system that will help you remember the important information. Now, if you're not able to mark in your text, you'll have to take notes on the text and then you can use your highlighting on that. At our particular school, we hand the people the text in a three ring binder uh, and then they're able to highlight that. This will keep the information uh, to, uh, speedily so that you can find the information for homework. And of course, if you take an open note test or quiz, you can find things quicker and easier that way as well. So let's take it the first um, possible marking. Now, these, this is an example that I use, but you can make up your own if you desire. So the, we did the bold face type, we highlighted in yellow. If we had formulas, we used a red star. Now, what would happen if we ended up with important people like Niels Bohr, or Antoine Lavoisier, or Isaac Newton, or Albert Einstein? Uh, if we had important people, you could put a, a square or circle the people's name. What about information that was emphasized in class? As a teacher, a lot of times I'll say, hey, take a look at your text in this particular area, and this is really important. Well, if you had that, and I was uh, teaching on natural indicators like this right here, what you could do is you could put brackets around your text to show exactly where something was emphasized in class. A lot of times there's things emphasized in class where there's no homework, but this might end up on a vocabulary list. This might end up in an explanation or a question where you need to figure something out. So that becomes an, uh, advantageous to you if it was emphasized in class. Now, questions from the text that need to be asked in class. For example, let's say in this particular uh, document, which again is from CK12, in this particular document, the, these ideas of equilibrium, you're just not clear on what equilibrium is. So you can circle that and then put big question marks next to it. 
And what that means is the next time in, I'm in class, I can actually ask the teacher, hey, can you go to page such and such and look at these words and explain them to me? Um, because that was incredibly helpful. If you don't ask questions in class, you're at a disadvantage. So hopefully, in your watching of this video, you've learned a few things about how to read a science text. I want to make sure you understand this. How you read the science text gives you an idea of the process of thinking that the science writer wants you to have. That process of thinking, what comes first, what comes second, what comes third, is incredibly important because it trains your brain to look for systems. Look for things that are going to get you from point A to point B. We are not looking for answers. What we're looking for is the right process because the answer will always fall out. The scripture teaches that if you abide in me, is what Christ said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall bear much fruit. We have a tendency to concentrate on the fruit all the time, but the Bible teaches us to abide and the abiding will give us the fruit. I think the same thing applies in our aspects of reading. If we read correctly, the solutions will come. I hope that you found this helpful.